Uh, we're going to do a couple of lightning talks here. So our first one is Alan Hannon. He's talking about securing physical access. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Alan Hannon. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Thanks also to the program committee as well as the uh, all the NEDOG members for having me here to talk. I timed it earlier, it's about five minutes, hopefully I'll be brief. Uh, for some of you that work in Fortune 500 companies or work in other areas, your executives think it's a great idea to move to the public cloud. In a couple of years, they're going to decide that was a terrible idea and ask you to move stuff out of the public cloud into a data center. There's a couple of things that we've learned in that process that I thought I'd share with you guys, as well as some other learnings about uh, some good habits to do when it comes to physical security. I work for a computer security company called CrowdStrike, I've been there about four years. Um, I see things every day that just scare the heck out of me. Uh, it's really hard to be safe, but it's pretty easy to be safer. So I'm going to walk through a few things we think about. The target audience here really is not for your traditional telco or ISP. It's not really targeted at folks that run their own physical plants or run their own physical data centers. Really targeted at folks that are building space inside of co-location carriers, somewhere between five and 200 cabinets, uh, folks that care about security. Uh, from my point of view, everyone should care about security, but there's different levels there. I'm uh, going to briefly talk about these areas. Uh, first off, when you build your cage and cabinet, I'd recommend that you think about it from a perspective of a concentric secure enclave, where you have a perimeter with uh, multiple layers inside. Uh, it's really trivial to put cameras all around your data center so you can see what's going on. You can run that off-site and store it at another location. Uh, one thing we found is it makes a lot of sense to lock the individual doors on the cabinets and cages. I've heard some folks think it's silly to put doors on cabinets if you have a cage. That hasn't been our experience. Uh, key card everything uh, and put door sensors everywhere you can. We have a lock box where we have certain keys. We have a magnet read sensor on that so we can know when that lock box is opened. Uh, these read switches cost five bucks. You run them on, on cat five back to a dry contact sensor and you have great telemetry where things are opened and shut. Uh, certainly they're not full, foolproof. Uh, there's ways to you know, clip the wires and fake them out, but it gives you a really good level of security. And the other big thing is to, to really audit your logs. Work with your vendor, treat them as your external defense. Uh, ask them to produce logs, videos to show you that they can produce what they say they're doing. Also do that for yourself. Uh, it's pretty easy these days to encrypt circuits. When I first started looking at this, I, I thought I was going to have to build a mass of IPsec things. And what I found is that you know there's a half dozen people in the market today that for 15 grand will sell you a piece of equipment, or well, for seven grand, a piece of equipment that'll do 100 gig uh, line rate encryption. So we found that really helpful. Uh, anything outside the data center we encrypt. Um, when you do that, sometimes you need to be really careful about what kind of spec you give on the circuit, like OTU4E, for example. Little graphic at the bottom right, you know, the router uh, produces an unencrypted circuit, um, 100 gig, that goes into an OTU4E, 112 gig, with framing that does the encryption uh, telemetry, and then you just produce an encrypted line out to your dark fiber or to your lambdas. Encryption key management is really important. I think we've all read in the news about how some of that stuff's been worked around by certain people and groups. Uh, roll your keys periodically, make it a policy. Put your uh, root keys in an HSM. Uh, do two-factor where it makes sense. Probably doesn't make sense with a HSM. Uh, store everything encrypted. It's great that you have an encrypted disk on your laptop. You should also have encrypted files and passwords. Uh, use Shamir's secret sharing scheme when you can for the actual uh, backside propagation of information and uh, really keep a lookout for any default passwords. Change those immediately. Don't make it something you do later. Encryption at rest is remarkably easy to do these days. Uh, most things we're deploying, and I think a lot of you are deploying, are SSDs. Most SSDs come with uh, SED, self-encrypting disks. It's really trivial to build a system that uses a a uh, key escrow system, uh, a, a secret server that'll be able to pull the discrete keys out to unlock those disks on boot. Uh, you're not literally unlocking them, you're literally providing a keck that's used to unencrypt the mech to pull the data off. So it's always encrypted, uh, but in this manner it, it requires an unlock when it's powered on. 
a little bit of detail here. In some circumstances, it makes sense to encrypt your logical volume or your actual data itself in a database, for example. You have to make your own decisions about the level you want to go to. <clears throat> One thing for folks that are in the kind of product world or, or the service world, if you think your company might eventually work with the government or any government, uh, you should think really hard about the kind of uh, ciphers and cryptographic protocols you should use because it's uh, a lot easier to do that right the first time than it is to retrofit it. Um, this is kind of my soapbox stand. I don't know what percent. Just for fun, how many folks in the audience work for vendors that sell uh, hardware equipment or software to companies? Yeah, they've all gone home already. Um, so whenever possible, just avoid vendor access. Uh, you know, the, the, the funny YouTube videos down there, how easy it is to get in somewhere with a ladder or with a clipboard or a yellow vest, it's really true. Uh, escort your vendor at all times. Don't trust them out of your site. Don't allow them to handle equipment for you. Um, just treat them as an advisor, someone that's there to inspect and give you information. That's all I've got. Thanks. I think we got two minutes for questions if anyone has any. Matt Pedak, Yahoo. Why, yes, you guessed that correctly. You tossed a little bombshell out there at the start that, you know, we're all moving into the cloud, but in two years we're going to be moving it back out of the cloud. Hey, can you spend half a minute and just tell us why you think everyone's going to move out of the cloud in two years? Um, I'm generally wrong, Matt, so you shouldn't rely on my <laughs> prognostications. But uh, what I've heard from other people in the industry is that um, in certain circumstances, companies find that running their own data centers has become bloated through vendor addiction and uh, certain HR policies about people that work in data centers. And they've created a very bloated uh, P&L. And they find that they can shrink that P&L by giving half of that waste to someone like Amazon, Azure, or another vendor. And so I think once they get there, you'll see a bit of a, an ebbing tide coming back where they'll say, why are we spending $600 a year for a disk that costs $100, and uh, maybe we should think about cutting our costs. I'm, I'm disappointed. I actually thought it was going to be about security, so I, I was half hoping you were going to say that there was some deep, dark secret about security in the cloud that meant, from a security perspective, we wanted to pull everything back, but it's just about money. Okay. <laughs> well, is it always about money? Uh, I, I think a lot of things are about money in the, in the total cost of ownership, and uh, I'll preface what I'm going to say that I try to be very honest, never trust a guy who say, says he's honest, and my book is to preach that cloud security is safe. But I would challenge you to talk about situations where Fortune 500 companies uh, have had significant security problems with Amazon, Azure, uh, Google Compute. Uh, certainly we've seen tremendous breaches with consumer applications. I'm sure we've seen breaches with uh, enterprise applications as well. But uh, you know, hats off and tremendous kudos to the guys at the big cloud providers who've done a great job with security to now. Gotcha. Thank you. Hi, Jake Kuhn, Semantic. So you've talked about a lot of the components of a, secure, of a physical security. Um, how about, what are your thoughts on how that gets integrated into an operations level? Does a NOC monitor? Um, the physics, physical security, do they monitor encryption keys for drives or, or, or specify encryption keys for drives? Is it a different group? Um, how is that split up from an operations perspective? So I know of one company that has four facets on that. There's a corporate uh, IT security group which is looking at finding problems. There's another group that's setting policy for how security should be done. And then there's a production operation security team that is doing constant audits, automated audits. So for example, in whether you use Ansible or Chef, it's pretty trivial to put a script in that checks to see if a disk's encrypted and flag that if it's not. Uh, a lot of the telemetry stuff goes into a simple SEM, so you can watch for things there. Um, I, I think the imp implementation of it is really complicated. There's no magic bullet, but it takes a lot of work. And I think what I'm kind of promoting is that you need to think about these things when you build it out because a lot of them are really easy to do and they're not very expensive. Um, but then how you actually affect that change and implement that policy and run it operationally, I think that's the hard part of operations. I don't think it's, it's ridiculously hard, but every implementation with the culture of the company has to be done differently. Thank you. Um, 
It's Matt Ringel from Akamai. So given that you'll see, as, as I was saying, if there's a trend to pull stuff back from the cloud, and vendor access is to some extent a reality of the market, um, do you expect we'll see a swing towards more hardening of hardware, like you know gyroscopes or being able to quick wipe RAM to avoid against liquid nitrogen attack or things like that? Do, do what was the last one? I, don't, I didn't hear that. Um, injecting liquid nitrogen to freeze oh. the RAM. Um, any, any sort of kind of more hardware hardening, TCM kind of thing? Yeah, that's kind of over my pay grade. Um, I, I'm scared to death about the fact that my supply chain is, is potentially vulnerable, and it's hard for me to go in and validate that the, the precursors to the firmware are, are what I expect them to be, or that my reliance on, on signatures is accurate. I, I want to be unconfrontational, which is difficult for me, but I don't accept that vendors have to have access. There's no vendor that has any sort of access to my stuff. So I realize that in a lot of environments that makes sense, like a lot of disk uh, uh, storage people, uh, you know, bring your disks in and plug them in and tell you when to change them. If that's the risk policy, it's okay, that's fine, but it's certainly not required by us. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, thanks guys. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jeremy Palmer. He's going to talk about automated DDoS protection. Jeremy. All right. Good afternoon, and welcome to the very last presentation of Nanog 73. Um, congratulations on you guys for making it this far. All right. So I'm Jeremy Palmer, uh, Senior Backbone Network Engineer for Flexential. And before I get started, I need to uh, thank our, um, our VP of Network Strategy, Mr. Tim Parker, since uh, mo most of you probably already know him, uh, for giving me this opportunity for my very first Nanog talk and coming up with the uh, original idea for the topic. Now, a little bit about Flexential, since I'm sure some of you have never heard of Flexential before. Um, Flexential was created in 2017 with the merger of two first-class data center providers, Peak 10 and BioWest. Uh, altogether, we have 41 data centers and <clears throat> 41 data centers and seven POPs in multiple markets. Uh, we have a 100 gigabit based backbone, and uh, I think it's over 3 million square feet of data center footprint. The Flexential Backbone Network, which is used to connect all of our data center and POP sites together. Uh, it's three terabit per second capacity, over 12,000 route miles, lots of dark fiber, and automated DDoS scrubbing, which is included at no additional charge with our managed bandwidth product. Okay, I'm gonna talk a, uh, talk a little bit about the staff's steps to mitigate a DDoS attack on the Flex Central Backbone. Um, and I got to uh, tip my hat to Taylor for his excellent um, presentation on DDoS and BGP flow spec. Um, hopefully I don't rehash too much of what he talked about. Step one, attack detection, because uh, of course you can't mitigate an attack if you don't know about it. Uh, there's a couple different ways we can do this. Net flow based detection. Um, it's pretty inexpensive and easy to deploy because your um, border router should already be exp exporting net flow. Uh, however, it's a slower detection method, mainly because you have that net flow export lag, meaning there's gonna be a time delay from when the attack starts to when um, that flow is, is exported by the router and detected by your DDoS detection system. Now, packet-based detection can be faster. Um, you basically have, um, you're basically looking at that packet flow in real time, but uh, again, it's a more expensive, or the trade-off is it's a more expensive deployment, um, a little more involved because you generally have to install dedicated packet sniffers either in line or off of fiber taps with your border routers. Uh, step two, once we've detected the attack, we need to reroute that attack traffic to somewhere we can deal with it and somewhere we can scrub it. Um, one way we can do this is we can announce a slash 24, what we call our redirect route, uh, and we announce this out to all our border routers. We use special blocking communities, and I'll go into this a little more in a minute here, but this withdraws any existing slash 24 prefix from uh, providers that don't do DDoS scrubbing for us. And then of course step three, we need to scrub out that bad traffic and we need to return the clean traffic to the original destination. Uh, we can do this by injecting a slash 32 scrub route um, into our scrubbing providers AS, and then we bring that clean traffic back in 
through a dedicated DDoS router and circuit. So um, here we have an example, uh, a basic example network topology. Um, consists of three data center sites, all connected with a high-speed backbone, and um, all part of the same ASN. In data center A and data center B, we have border routers B1 and B2, which connect to our upstream transit providers. And in data center B, we have customer, and their IP address is 192.0.25. And they are showing red on our monitoring system, and this is because they have a large DDoS attack incoming to uh, their IP address. Uh, our DDoS detector is sitting over here to the right, and it is receiving NetFlow-based or packet-based flow data from uh, our border routers B1 and B2. And so at this point, it's automatically detected that an attack has been launched against our customer. The next thing we need to do is we need to funnel that attack traffic into um, the AS that's doing our DDoS scrubbing for us. So in this example, we'll say that we've purchased um, DDoS scrubbing services or managed DDoS mitigation services from AS209 or CenturyLink. Um, our DDoS detector utilizing XBGP will inject a redirect route for 192.0.2.0/24, which contains the IP address that's under attack. And it announces it out to a DDoS route reflector, and this sends it out to all the border, all the border routers. Uh, border router one receives that route, and it sees that there is a community string for block level three in there, and so it effectively withdraws that route, uh, or withdraws that prefix from level three. The same thing occurs when router B2 receives that redirect route. It sees a, uh, it sees a blocking community for Telia, and it withdraws that prefix from Telia. At this point, um, both attack traffic and normal traffic to that slash 24 are now ingressing through our AS209 transit peers. However, the customer is still red at this point. And so what we gotta do now is we need to pull all the traffic in for that one IP address that's under attack into AS209 scrubbing service. So what we've done is if you look down at data center C at the bottom, we've added uh, what we call a DDoS router, and that has a physical clean traffic circuit back into AS209 scrubbing service. Um, and what our DDoS detector will do, uh, again, using XBGP, it will inject the scrub route for the actual slash 32 IP address that's under attack, um, and it will tag that with a special community that identifies it as a scrub route. The DDoS router receives that, and it will announce that out to AS209 scrubbing service. And uh, at that point, AS209 has a more specific route um, for that slash 32, and so the traffic will now ingress through AS209 scrubbing service. The bad traffic is scrubbed out, the clean traffic is returned over the dedicated clean traffic link to our DDoS router, and it is forwarded, the DDoS router forwards that traffic back into our core where it can be normally routed back across our backbone to data center B and to the original customer destination. Uh, customer is now green because we have mitigated their DDoS attack, and normal traffic to uh, the rest of that slash 24 continues to ingress through our normal AS209 transit peers. And it's important to note that um, step two, the, the redirection, and step three, the attack scrubbing, can really happen at the exact same time. Um, we can look at a BGP route visual to kind of see this uh, in action. Uh, and compare a before and after. Now this is the before, the before um, we inject that scrub route, or redirect route, I'm sorry. Um, we're, the, the green dot in the middle is flex central, and you can see that this prefix has uh, connectivity to lots of different ASNs out and going out in all directions. And this is what it's gonna look like after we inject that redirect route. You can see that all, re all roads for that prefix now lead to our scrubbing provider to AS, and there's one single path back to the flex central, the green dot. So in closing, I just want to uh, point out something that we learned with DDoS mitigation, one size does not fit all. Um, this method of DDoS redirect that we just uh, went over works best with prefixes originated from your own ASN, uh, and it can also work well for BGP single home customers that announce their own routes to you and use you as transit. Now, um, downstream customers who BGP multi-home to your network and to, say, another transit provider network uh, need some special consideration. 
Um, the main thing is uh, if customer connects to you and another network for transit, then of course, depending on how they're announcing their routes, the inbound, or when they do get attacked, the inbound attack traffic could be coming in through one of the other transit providers and could completely bypass your network and your DDoS mitigation system. One other thing we learned with this traffic redirect method is that, um, and we've learned this in the lab luckily, is customers need to filter their own prefixes inbound um, or under certain circumstances they could learn that redirect route from the other transit provider and uh, that can cause bad things like routing loops and black holes. Um, it's probably a good idea to um, filter your own routes inbound anyway. Um, uh, either way, this type of customer is a very small percentage for us, so it's pretty manageable. And uh, so you guys have learned a little bit about one way we can do DDoS, uh, automated DDoS mitigation on a service provider network. Um, I challenge you to take some of this um, back and maybe implement it or uh, variations of it uh, to solve some of your DDoS mitigation issues. Um, any questions? Uh, Matt P. Tech, Yahoo. Uh, Jeremy, great talk, thank you. I'm a little curious taking what you were just talking about here with one of the earlier talks, I had the picture of the uh, carpet bomb attack. And, and one of the assumptions in this is I've got one slash 32 that's being attacked and it's very clear that the one slash 32 is being attacked. So the rest of the 24 can just flow normally. Um, any thoughts on if you do start to see like a carpet bomb style attack where the whole slash 24 is being hit, uh, scaling problems with this? Is this the sort of mitigation that's going to work when there's multiple IPs or is this, well, you can fix one IP or two IPs, but beyond that, it's not going to scale well? Uh, I think that's a good point, yeah. Um, yeah, and going back to uh, Taylor's presentation, um, I, I agree with you. This solution works great for, you know, just a few IPs that are under attack, and this is generally what we've seen in the past with most of our customers. Um, we've been using this solution for a couple years now, um, and you know, cross the fingers, we've actually never seen any carpet bomb attack. Now, it probably is not going to work that well. Um, I, I think the biggest problem is, you know, like, like Taylor was saying, if every source IP is only sending two megabits, then your detection system is probably not going to detect that in the first place. Um, so yeah, we, we are looking at some other solutions right now. Um, and we are also looking at um, you know, BGP flow spec, which you know, is probably not going to solve the carpet bombing problem. Um, but yeah, we are, we are aware that is a weakness of the solution. Got it. So for any, any script kiddies that are watching the webcast later, please, 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 no carpet bombing. We don't want that. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you for listening.